Hi everybody and welcome back to the stool testing series. Today is the biggie. I think this is the one that most people have been waiting for. It is the interpretation of the Biome FX. Guys, I was so excited to get this. I waited patiently. It took like five or six weeks for this bad boy to come back in. And while it had a lot of pros, it actually had its fair share of cons for me. And there was some, some issues that I really just haven't been able uh, to fully wrap my head around. So I'm gonna share with you the pros and the cons. I think it's a really good test. Um, there was a lot of careful thought and planning and effort and data analysis that went into this. Um, and they actually, the company has some YouTube videos about like what all of the things mean and they give you a lot of supplementary material, which I really appreciate. Um, but let's get into the pros, the cons, and overall the interpretation of the Biome FX stool test. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And here we go. So Biome FX, this is a sample that I just did in the last month or two. And right out the get-go, you can see that they give you a really nice summary page right on page one. So they, they give you a gut microbiome index. It's kind of like a collection of all of the things. And you can see that mine's DEES, not great, but DEES. Uh, they give you two different measurements of diversity. So they give you alpha diversity, which basically you could think of that as the number of species you have in your sample. Mine is a little bit on the lower side, but as a person who had a lot of antibiotics in my lifetime, that's actually not terribly surprising. Um, and then beta diversity, you could basically think about like how similar or dissimilar your species are to the people around you. So like me living here in America, uh, the species that I have are pretty representative for my region of the world and the samples that would be around me. So that's what you could think of for beta diversity. And then the richness or the resistome occurrence, they basically explain this and say that this is, um, so in order to have a diverse ecosystem, you need each individual type of bacteria to be able to resist or fight off other types of bacteria. Right, so like if your lactobacilli are WIBs and they can't fight off, you know, E. coli or whatever, then the other bacteria will overtake them and then squash them down and then that doesn't lead to a diverse situation. You want to have everybody in that community to have some like resistance, if you will, or like make some antimicrobial substances against those other bacteria so that they can all keep each other in check. And that is what they're measuring with this resistome is the genes that are associated with those functions. And you can see that mine are pretty low. One of the things that comes up in the supplementary materials down below, I believe it's the next page, is that that tends to go down with recent antibiotic use in particular. So again, kind of makes sense for you know my history that I've had a lot of antibiotics, not in the last year, thank God, but in my lifetime, I've had a boatload. So that made some degree of sense for me. It's still something I would like to improve, but it's basically you're given three different ways to assess diversity, basically. Um, and it's a really nice overview of that. I think that this test is the most thorough as far as helping you assess and understand your diversity. So that definitely gets a point. Uh, the pathogen control index is pretty self-explanatory. I had two things that were out of range. Now, interestingly, I had another test, which I'm gonna review next, uh, my Somogen test actually said that my E. coli was very high. So it's interesting that only a month, month and a half prior, no, that's like two months prior, it said that my E. coli was low. So that was very curious that there was that big of a discrepancy when both of these companies use basically the same technology. This is called shotgun sequencing. Um, but on mine, it said that C. diff was elevated, which is super not cool. Then if you come down here, they give you the snapshot, we're gonna get into this more, but they give you a snapshot of some of the bacterial species that are high and low. Uh, personally, guys, if you ever see Acromancia or Fecalobacterium elevated, generally speaking, I'm doing a jig. Uh, those are good. Now keep in mind that these are like, more or less they're bell curve analyses against what is typical. It doesn't mean that this range is the healthy range, it's just there's a strong likelihood that it is. So if I have more acromancia than the normal Joe Schmo, I'm not gonna cry about that. And if I have more Fecalobacterium pretzinitzii than the average Joe Schmo, I'm not gonna cry about that because both of them are very protective species. But you can see on mine, you know, I've got not a whole lot of Ruminococcus, this particular species that is, 
uh, bifido, lactobacillus, buterococcus, some of these others are low, and my eubacterium rectale was high. So we're gonna get into some of those momentarily. And then they give you these functional ranges of like what things your microbiome has the capability of producing for you. And we're gonna get into, this is actually my biggest issue with the entire test so far is the butyrate production genetic component of it, but we're gonna get the, to that in just a minute. So anyway, this is the first page and they give you a really nice overview. So let's march on. They break it down more. So they give you more of an explanation on the resistome, the alpha and beta diversity. They put you on a plot with everybody else. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, then to their credit, they give this nice phylum overview. I've mentioned this in other videos, but I like to get that eagle eye view of what the phylums look like or the phyla rather look like. And then that way, you know, it's, it's like the first step of assessing the microbiome, in my opinion, is to see this like eagle eye overview. And you can see that they give you uh, the healthy US population versus my sample. Now I will say this of this particular test, the data collection from Cosmos ID and the way that they're basing their normal ranges is much more sophisticated and I think much more accurate than any other test that's available on the market right now. Um, and basically there was a video on their YouTube channel that you could watch still, uh, but Karen, the, the guy who's like the head of Microbiome Labs, he was talking about it and he explained that uh, Cosmos ID, the company that does this test, has been collecting and mining data from stool samples, you know, big projects like the Human Microbiome Project, the American Gut Project. They've been taking that data and they've been combing through it and mining it for years and years and years. And they have also been looking at things like studies, you know, where, you know, the, the diversity is compared to somebody with Crohn's or colitis or IBS. And they've been validating these ranges for a long time. I think he said since 2004. And I think that that is probably the best that we have as far as like establishing what truly is a healthy normal range uh, versus I shared in my gut zoomer report, for example, and my Genova GI effects report that both of those companies it took what they called a healthy normal cohort, which they did not elaborate on which I believe they probably just like, they probably just sampled the employees, I don't know. Um, but they took what they deemed to be a healthy normal cohort and they tested about 150 or I think 193 for the gut zoomer uh, people. And then they plotted everybody based off of that. And that's how they came up with their, their normal ranges. So that is, I think, far less reliable versus this, we have a lot of data to support this. So that is actually a really neat thing about this test as well. So if you look here, for example, what they have shown here is that in a healthy US cohort, they are seeing about a 60% prevalence of bacteroidetes versus about a 30% prevalence of firmicutes, and then smaller increments of these other bacteria versus my own, where I have quite a lot more firmicutes and less bacteroidetes, and actually they weren't really picking up so much on proteobacteria. And you can see over here that my proteobacteria was in like the 24th uh, percentile on this, this bell curve analysis. So mine was low. Now again, similar to the conversation above, if I have lower than normal levels of proteobacteria, I'm not gonna cry because proteobacteria are the bad guys of the microbiome. They are gram negative LPS producing, bad hombres. So I don't want a lot of them. I'm totally cool with the fact that my proteobacteria are in the lower portion of that bell curve and it's not even showing up on this donut chart. So I'm kind of cool with that, honestly. But you could see per their information, at least for proteobacteria, the average is about 2.86% for the US population, which is right about on par with what I've been saying. I've been saying that you don't want proteobacteria higher than like three or 4%. So that would parallel what I've seen with 16S testing as well. Um, but So they give you this. Now I will say, you know, I've, um, I've been more of the schooling and the, mind, the mindset that you want relatively more firmicutes than what this test is suggesting. So I tend to like firmicutes in like the 50, 60 plus percent range and bacteroidetes more in like the 20, 30, 40% range. So I'm actually happy that I have more firmicutes and less bacteroidetes. I'm kind of cool with that, but you know, it, it is what it is. 
Uh, and then down here, you can see that they give you the percent relative abundance, which I think is very important because now we could theoretically take this test. Now again, different technology, so you're gonna get different stuff, but we could theoretically do one of these tests, see that say like, you know, if bacteroidetes is too high, for example, and we have this raw percent given as a percent of the abundance, and then we could turn around and we could do a 16S test, or we could do another type of test that gives a percentage and we can compare apples to apples a little bit more clearly. I mean, we're, we're comparing like a nasty red delicious apple with a delicious Granny Smith apple, but it is at least apples to apples versus, like I said in the gut zoomer test, they have the weird like correction factor and their own range. And it's just, it's really difficult to figure out what they're actually giving you um, as far as the numbers go. So you really can't compare that test to anything else. So I have a big problem with that. But um, I like that they give you that here, they give you the numbers, and then uh, they give you the percentile, again, charted based off of their data, what they believe to be normal. Now we're zooming in quite a bit more. So remember we go from uh, the phylum are the biggest kind of overarching overview of the microbiome, and then we zoom in more and more as the test progresses. So now we're down at the family level. So this is two, uh, two levels down. And you can see that we're breaking it down a little bit more bit by bit. Um, I'm gonna skip over this for the moment and I'll just show you a couple that I really like to start looking at. So for example, here is the family that Acromantia belongs to, which you can tell by the name. And you can see I'm up at the 92nd percentile. And then if we come over here, we could follow this across, say Acromantia. They are saying that the normal for the US population is 0.07 to 1.45, which I think is quite low. Uh, I'm usually saying you wanna be between three and 5%, at least on 16S testing, I've been saying that for a long time. And over here, you can see that I was at 4.9%. So I'm right at the upper end of what I've been saying for a while anyway. So I'm actually quite happy that I have higher than normal acrobancy. I think that's fine. That's not high enough that I'm concerned about it. Um, then we could come down here. Here's bifidobacterium. So this is looking, you know, for all intents and purposes, we're looking at bifido as a whole when we look at this. Because again, we're at the family level here. And you can see their normal is 0.07 to 2.66. Um, that I think is also a bit low. I like to see it more in the range of like, three to 5% kind of similar to acromancia in an ideal world. And you can see that mine is down at 0 0.18. So that is quite low. So it's actually, in my opinion, it's even lower than what the percentile reflects it's at. Um, so we've got some there. Uh, you could see some others, you know, a lot of these you could, you could read about on your own. I'm not gonna make this into like a 500 minute long video, but just to give you an idea of like what you're looking at here and some of the big categories. Um, let's move on to a couple more. Uh, I honestly don't know too, too much about these. I need to kind of put a pin in this and come back to it. So I'm going to move along. Sorry. <laughs> uh, they give you these ratios, which are nice. Again, I usually, I'm usually looking at the individuals rather than the ratios between the two, but you know, for what it is, um, this one, for example, mine was very low. This is a great example. It's the ratio between proteobacteria and actinobacteria, and both of those were low for me. So that, I mean, I'm, I'm more caring about those. Like I wanna boost actinobacteria, and I don't really care as much about the proteobacteria. I'm not worried about those being low, like I said. So uh, they give you the ratios. I think that's, you know, not really, um, anything I'm gonna focus on too much. Now getting down here to some of the pathogens, uh, they have another page, I think it's the next page, where they tell you everything that they tested for. And you can see that three things were detected in my sample uh, that could be potential pathogens. They've got C. diff, which is elevated by a fair margin. That's more than what I'm comfortable with. Uh, you've got E. coli, Escherichia coli, and that is low. Again, I'm not really worried about E. coli being low. It's not it's not such a great thing that I'm thinking I need to be worried about it. But what I'll show you in another test, which is interesting, and also it just, it tells you that stool is not a homogenous substance. Honestly, you guys, like no matter what, if you take multiple stool samples over the course of days or weeks or months, they will look different. And it's not always gonna be in ways that are predictable or are reflective of what you've been doing. So in this test that I collected, you know, it looks like, um, I think I actually collected this in August and it was, I think the results came out in September actually. 
But in this particular sample, my E. coli was quite low. Uh, in another shotgun sequencing test, my E. coli was very high. So I'll show you that in the next video in the series. Uh, Bilophila wadsworthia. This actually is a really great one that they test for. And this is one of the strengths of the test, I think, is that they actually do test for this. Uh, Bilophila wadsworthia is a gram-negative proteobacteria bacteria that goes up in high fat environments. It really loves things like the keto diet and Atkins and particularly a lot of saturated fat will make this go up. And it is a big old hydrogen sulfide producer. So you don't want this to be around, or at least not a lot. The range that I've been saying for a while that mirrors uh, Jason Haverlech's range is that this plus another bacteria called the Sulfa vibrio piger should be below like 0.1% of the microbiome. So you can see I'm still squeaking by on that range that I give myself. So I think that's fine as it is. Uh, but I do have some bilophilus. So it makes me wonder if I went full on Atkins and I just went out the wazoo with saturated fat, I think that this guy would probably bloom and that something like Atkins would be a very bad idea for me to do. Yes, yeah, so here's the entire list of what all they test for. Uh, this is also a relative strength of this test is that they actually do test for quite a lot of pathogens. Um, this is in contrast with the other shotgun sequencing test that I like uh, in the sense that the other test, Somogen, does not really test for as many overt pathogens. So that's something to keep in mind when you're comparing the two. Uh, then we get into the functional analysis. And this was something that I was really, really excited about. And this is actually my biggest source of disappointment in this test. Uh, I was really excited at the thought of them looking at genes for the production of different compounds. And I thought that is going to be super, super cool. Now I've been trying to do something like this for a while. I've been basically taking the data from like a, th a Thrive test, for example or you buy them when it existed. And I've been rounding up and, and uh, collecting the data, say like all of the butyrate producers. I have a list of known butyrate producers and I just go through and I tabulate each one and I add them up and I have a number, um, again, basically following Jason Harvalek's data on this and his, his studies and saying, all right, I want this to be about 40% of the microbiome or greater. And then I, I make an assumption odd butyrate production off of that number. But here they're actually looking for the genes. So it's going to be a bit, uh, it should, you would think, be more accurate than me going through and just adding up bacteria. However, uh, we'll get into this momentarily. So again, they're looking at these and it's basically a bell curve. You're looking at a bell curve analysis off of what they have deemed to be a healthy U.S. population. Keeping in mind, I think that this lab actually does the best job at at really showing you what a healthy population is going to look like, truly. Um, so you can kind of take this with a bit more, uh, like a, a bit more usefulness. And I'll point out right here too, on this beginning page, it says right here, this section explores your gut microbiome for genes known to contribute metabolically important functions. So when they look, for example, at saccharolytic uh, fermentation, they're not looking at, say, the end products, or they're not measuring anything specific to this. They are measuring the genes. And when we get into the butyrate conversation, this is where some of my frustration comes up. They're not measuring actual butyrate. They're measuring the butyrate producing genes, which is a different story. So here we go. So saccharolytic fermentation, this is basically the breakdown of carbohydrates. This is going to be where you get, uh, as they, they depict here, gases, short chain fatty acids, much more so than proteolytic fermentation. So they really should have like a, a little weak dotted line coming from that and a very solid line coming over here. Uh, and then also lactate and then that controls the pH and inhibits pathogens and does cool stuff for you. So they give you a lot of these nice diagrams and it's a really nice learning tool, this stool test. So if you look here, my saccharolytic fermentation, my carbohydrate fermentation looks like it's on the lower end of the normal range which is surprising for me because I eat a fair amount of whole grains and like sweet potatoes and squash. And I really don't skimp out on carbs necessarily. I try not to do a lot of sugar and processed carbs, um, but I'm definitely not skipping out on the carbs. So that was really surprising to me that mine was on the lower end of normal. Um, and then this is going to be one of your major pathways to make short chain fatty acids, 
which are those cool anti-inflammatory substances that basically tell your immune system to chill the F out. So it's a really good pathway to keep around. And you can see that mine was on the lower end of the normal range, which made me raise an eyebrow. Now here's where we get into where I was very confused. And I did a practitioner support call with the company and they left me feeling more confused and quite a bit more frustrated. So you can see here, butyrate production. I saw this and I thought, oh my God, I am doomed. And I was at the zeroth percentile which is atrocious and like, holy crap. Um, so I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh my God, I have no butyrate, which is very confusing. Um, I eat things like they, uh, let's see, they have some stuff here. All right, uh, I don't really eat bran, who does? But I eat a lot of oligosaccharides. I eat resistant starch. I eat complex carbohydrates. Like I have the substrate going into my body to make butyrate, so, WTF. And here's the thing. So this, I'm going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail on this, but run with me anyway. So you can see that I'm at the zeroth percentile. I have just this like little weak, sad smidgen of butyrate production capacity. And then when we come down here, the last couple pages of the report show you some of your short chain fatty acid producers. And lo and behold, uh, Fecalobacterium prudsnitzii is your biggest single butyrate producer typically. And, you know, they, they say intestinal health and short chain fatty acids, but just know that it's a butyrate producer specifically. Uh, Fecalobacterium prudsnitzii, mine was just a tad elevated. So that's very confusing to me. If I have a butyrate producing microbe and it's measured health, not only healthy, but elevated, how do I have such low butyrate production capacity? Similarly, then you come down here and you really start wondering about this test. Eubacterium rectale is another big old butyrate producer, and it's labeled as a butyrate producer right here. And mine is crazy high, like way, way high. This is actually high enough that I'm, I'm almost like curious and concerned about it. Um, that is really freaking high. I mean, sure. And then we have some other, you know, like the ruminococcus that I mentioned earlier, that is also potentially a butyrate producer, if I remember correctly. And that was not detected, so that's a bummer. Uh, Roseburia can can make butyrate. Uh, you know, Buterococcus was not detected. So I don't have all of my butyrate producers, but I have a copious amount of at least two of them. And then you come back up here. Let's see, where did we leave off? And you see this, and my brain just kind of melted. And I, I, I just, I honestly got, I was scratching my head. So. I called the company, I, I had to wait a few weeks to do a call and I got on this phone and I will say this to preface, I don't remember who I spoke with. I don't remember if he works for Microbiome Labs or if he works for Cosmos ID. Because remember that the, the supplement company, Microbiome Labs, helped design and is selling the stool test, but the stool test itself and the technology and the data mining itself is coming from Cosmos ID. So we're actually talking about two different companies here. I don't know if the gentleman I spoke with worked for the supplement company or the lab company, but either way, uh, he left me more more confused and more frustrated and just like really feeling disillusioned with the test. So I talked to him for a while and I, I pointed out, I said, my biggest, my biggest single question or concern about this test is what I just pointed out to you guys. I said, my butyrate producers look spectacular and yet I have zero butyrate production. Like, how does that work? And he started going off and he, it was one of those situations where like, I couldn't get a word in edgewise, honestly. And he starts rambling on and basically it became apparent that he was acting as though the test measured butyrate as opposed to the genes. So I took a, I, I took a minute when I got a breath in edgewise and I said, well, wait, 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 but is this, I, I'm sorry, I was like, I'm confused. Is this test measuring butyrate or is it measuring the genes to make butyrate. And he straight up told me the wrong thing. And he said, no, it's measuring butyrate. And I was like, I'm, I'm like scratching my head. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. So going back here. So I just, I scrolled up on the page and he's rambling on, he's just going on and on and on. And I'm like, please God, shut up. And I come over here and I'm like, um, sorry to interrupt you, but, and I read him this line that I just read you guys. This section explores your gut microbiome for genes known to contribute metabolically important functions. So I told him, I was like, 
No, it, 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 I actually found a section. It says right here that this is measuring genes associated with these metabolically important functions. And he's like, oh, 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 and he backpedals. And I'm thinking, okay, clearly you don't know anything about the test and you're supposed to be educating me. So WTF, man. Um, and then he basically, he goes on to say, he's like, well, um, he said, well, uh, basically what you need to do is you need to, this, this suggests that you need to feed the butyrate producers. You're not giving them enough food. And I was like, well, first of all, yes, I am. I mean, I think I am. But I said, B, as you feed bacteria, they will reproduce and their numbers will go up. And judging by my numbers, that is happening because I have an abundance of these butyrate producers. So this is why I'm so confused. I know how I eat and I know that I'm feeding them what they want to be fed. And I'm looking at the data before me and I'm looking and clear as day, you can see that the numbers or the amounts of these butyrate producers is reflective of somebody who is feeding them on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet they don't have the genes to make butyrate. Like how, and he basically, he could not give me an answer, um, but he did bullshit me a lot. And it made me really, really deeply frustrated. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, like, I don't, I don't think I can recommend this test a lot. I mean, I'll probably use it a little bit here and there, but I don't think I can use it a whole lot because that is a huge discrepancy. And like, that's kind of a big selling point of this test is to see these metabolically important functions and like, if that doesn't line up with the data that they're giving me in the same damn test, and they're telling me in one breath that I have amazing levels of butyrate producers, but then in another breath, they're telling me that I have no butyrate production. It's just, it's very confusing. And honestly, like as a clinician, I can't recommend this test because then I don't know what I tell my freaking patient. Do I tell them they need to eat more, more, you know, things that the short chain fatty acid producers like? Do I need to have them eat more whole grains and more legumes and more resistant starch? Or do I tell them, no, you're good. Ignore the fact that your butyrate is in the toilet, pun intended, and just keep doing what you're doing. Like, I don't know. So that's why I needed to order the somogen test to make additional sense out of what I was looking at. And we're going to get to that in the next video. But now that I've shared that with you, um, this was the biggest single frustration and letdown of the entire test. If these things had lined up better and made more sense, I would be using this test all day, every day. But this was really disappointing and really frustrating to get back. And the fact that the guy who was supposed to be educating me on this test literally just bullshitted me and was so uneducated about the test that he was supposed to be teaching me about. It was just like, I can't, I can't even know. So anyway, marching on. Um, so now for the rest of this section, for this, um, you know, functional analysis of your gut microbiome for this section, take it with a big grain of salt because I really don't know what to make of it. And I don't know how accurate I think it is anymore. So marching on. Um, and again, I, I really liked it. Like on the surface level, looking at it, I thought that this looks like a really lovely test. Like, look, they break it down, propionate production, acetate production. I mean, this is lovely. The other short chain fatty acids, we have lactate production. As a side note, I had another situation with a patient where her, let me think, she had high lactate production and zero lactobacillus detected. I think that's what it was. Um, now that one I could wrap my head around a little bit more because there are other bacteria that produce lactate other than lactobacillus. It's just that lactobacilli are kind of like the powerhouse of lactate production. Um, but that I was able to kind of justify and wrap my head around a little bit better than the butyrate situation. Um, but you know, mine looked really nice where it is. Uh, lactate is very important for maintaining the pH of the colon in particular. Um, and it is very important for inhibiting things like candida and pathogens. So I know it got some bad press in the last few years, especially D-lactate. Just keep in mind that this test is not differentiating between L-lactate and D-lactate, one being relatively bad and one being relatively good. Um, so we don't know which one is which on this test. Um, I would assume L-lactate until proven otherwise. Uh, then we have proteolytic fermentation. The breakdown of protein is basically what you're looking at here. Now, 
you can make a smidgen of short chain fatty acids from protein and you can make some good metabolites from protein. However, uh, with your microbiome specifically, however, a lot of them are going to be bad hombres. So we have things like pea crystal, phenol, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide. Um, we're going to get into these in further sections, but overall, you don't want your proteolytic fermentation to be too high. Uh, if you see that you're on the high end of normal for proteolytic fermentation, I would suggest to you two things, is that either you're eating too much protein for your body's needs, and therefore more undigested protein is making it down to the colon and feeding your gut bugs, or you have sucky stomach acid or poor stomach acid production, and the meat that you're taking in and the protein you're taking in is not being broken down and absorbed enough by your body, it's escaping your digestive process, uh, digestive process, uh, and making it down to the colon. So if you see this high, I would think either excessive intake or inadequate protein digestion until proven otherwise. Uh, on the lower end, like me, again, it might just be that I'm digesting my meat really, really well and my protein really, really well. I think that's the case. Or it could also be uh, that I'm having inadequate intake potentially, but I don't think that's the case for me personally. Uh, polyamine production, again, you can see that I'm on you know, the lower end of normal, so that's good. Um, these are generally going to be uh, uh, particularly inflammatory at high levels. That's kind of the running theme with all of these things, is a lot of these metabolic byproducts in the protein section are okay in very small amounts, but if they're high, they become inflammatory. Uh, similarly, you know, ammonia, phenol. Ammonia is very important, particularly for the liver. So if you have any sort of liver condition, um, you know, NAFLD, cirrhosis, fatty liver, anything like that, I would be really um, like paying more attention to the ammonia specifically, because I could put a lot of tax on the liver. Um, hydrogen sulfide, this was another one that really left me scratching my head. Um, they said that I have none detected in my sample, zero. But recall, if you will, let's see, what page were we on when I said this? Um, recall, if, I, if you will, I did have a little bit of Bilophila wadsworthia. And the reason why we care about this bacteria really is because it's a hydrogen sulfide producer. So very curious. And I will point out too that on this next test that we're going to discuss in this series, the other uh, whole genome sequencing test, they said my bilophila was high. So wrap your head around this. Now again, stool is not homogenous and this was like two months apart, um, but very curious. And I'm very um, curious and frustrated that I clearly had detectable levels of a known hydrogen sulfide producer but they're saying here that it's not detected in my sample. So yeah, you can see my frustration here. Um, the methane production, um, th this is kind of curious too. They say I basically, at, it looks like the 10th percentile, but then they say it's not detected. So I should be at the zeroth percentile on this little chart, but that's, I'm kind of uh, making mountains out of molehills there. Uh, my GABA production is in the toilet, per my microbiome at least. Um, this is not super surprising because my lactobacilli were also quite in the toilet and lactobacilli are among the bacteria that are known to make GABA for you. So I'm not really surprised that that was low. Um, I would not say, by the way, I don't have anxiety necessarily. So I don't think that this is going to be a super useful marker um, for treating and understanding anxiety. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, you know, I, I have not a lot of GABA production that might be affecting my motility or it might be affecting something else. I don't know. Um, or it could be bollocks because apparently the rest of this test is not super reliable, uh, at least this section. So I don't know what to make of it. Uh, my glutathione production is right in the middle. Again, this is per your microbiome specifically. We're not talking about your liver's ability to make glutathione, your skin's ability, you know, whatever else. This is specific to the microbiome. So keep that in mind. I really like this little um, this little picture that they give you. They they really do go above and beyond with the education part of the test and really helping you understand what you're looking at, which is why I'm kind of breezing through some of these things too. Um, so basically, 
Now we get into uh, the last little bit for the protein degradation section, which is indole. Indole actually could be a really good thing. Um, I just read a paper, God, like this week, that was talking about an indole gradient repelling bad bacteria. So basically your good bacteria make indole and then it will uh, repel bad bacteria as they pass through your system. So it's a generally a better thing to have around is my understanding of it. Um, so that looked pretty decent. I was happy with that. Uh, the estrogen recycling, this is basically looking at beta-glucuronidase. So you can see they mentioned that here. Um, you can see that mine, you know, was low end of normal. I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, beta-glucuronidase is quite inflammatory at a high level, and it would be indicative of uh, an alkaline environment in the colon, which I don't want. So that, I think, is fine where it's at. I don't want that to be higher than it is. Um, of note, the two main things that acidify the pH of the colon and keep it healthy are lactate and short-chain fatty acids. And let's, uh, let's come back up here, and I have to remind myself here. So my lactate was right smack dab in the middle. So maybe that is helping control the pH of my colon and keeping that beta-glucuronidase production low. Uh, but uh, supposedly, according to this test, my short-chain fatty acid production sucks wind. So, you know, you would think that with poor short-chain fatty acid production, you would think that this number would be creeping up and be higher. So I think this is further supporting that my butyrate production is fine and it's more reflective of the numbers that I saw on the, the last page that I pointed to you guys. Um, but, you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, trying to make sense out of this data somehow. Uh, now onward, we've got bi vitamin biosynthesis. So they give you kind of an overall picture. You can see that this looks pretty grim for mine. Uh, but then we go through, you know, thiamine, vitamin B1, very important for motility, very important for autonomic nervous system function. And some bacteria really need it, like Fecalobacterium needs thiamine, but it can't make it on its own. Um, so that, as long as it's right about in the middle, I'm happy with that. Um, riboflavin, very important, especially for the histamine intolerant crowd. So kind of makes me wonder a little bit because I am kind of a mucus factory person. Um, this is important for, uh, riboflavin is a cofactor for the enzyme that makes Dow, uh, yeah, the enzyme that makes Dow. So in order to break down your dietary histamine, you need some riboflavin, whether that comes from your food or directly from your microbiome, you know, I, probably a little bit of both, but it looks like mine's on the lower end of normal per my microbiome at least. However, my microbiome is doing a dandy job making vitamin B5, so that's lovely. Uh, pyridoxine, vitamin B6 looks okay, lower end of normal perhaps. Biotin is low. Um, this was interesting too, because I started losing a bunch of hair around the beginning of the pandemic, and it was really, really stressful. Um, I, of course, I did the cliche thing and I took some biotin. Um, I don't think that's what turned it around for me personally, but that was interesting for me to see nonetheless. And you can see that they give you a bit of information about like, you know, who makes it and who uses it. So a little bit of recreational reading there. You can see that my ability to make folate per my microbiome is fine. Cobalamin, fine. Uh, and then vitamin K2 looks fine. So that was great. And then finally, we are wrapping up this beast of a test. Finally, we get into uh, the the bacteria, the keystone species that they give you. And again, I already mentioned high levels of Acromantia and Fecalobacterium presidentiae. I'm not going to cry about, especially this one because it's so close. Um, I'm really not too worried about that. Uh, Acromantia, it looks quite high per their ranges, but I think that their ranges are set too low. So, you know, I would prefer to see it up in the three to five percent range. So I'm actually okay with that. Uh, then again, we've got some cellulose degraders. But particularly, you could think of a lot of these as butyrate producers. So Rubidococcus, Roseburia, Eubacterium, uh, Buterococcus, all of those are short-chain fatty acid producers in some way, shape, or form. And then Lactobacilli and Bifidobacterium. Now, this is way oversimplifying. Like, they actually both produce acetate as an example. So, like, you can't even isolate it to just one or two things. But yes, Lactobacillus is more famous for the lactate production, and Bifido is more famous for the acetate production. So there's that. And you can see, Lactobacilli, I was like barely, barely, barely there. And B. longum specifically was not detected, although I did have a little smidgen of other Bifidobacterium species in my sample. 
Um, and that is it. So that is the beast that is the BiomeFX. Again, I was really, really excited to get this test. I waited very patiently for it. Uh, my two biggest hesitancies to recommend this test, first and foremost, is I don't know what the heck is going on with the situation with the, you know, the genetics versus the levels of the bacteria. I will elaborate that. Uh, I will elaborate on that a little bit in my Somogen test because there was something that I was looking for specifically to confirm or deny that information in Somogen that they test for that this one does not. So there was another layer to the equation that made me curious with Somogen. Um, but yeah, overall, um, really the discrepancies that I saw with the metabolic function like genetic portion of the test versus what was actually measured in the test, I'm just, I'm still scratching my head. I don't know what to make of it. Um, I'm, I think that they do actually a pretty, pretty good job assessing some of the bad guys, the pathogens. Um, they do a, a really lovely job assessing diversity and richness and all of that jazz. And like, there's a lot of really good information in this test. But again, like the selling point and the uniqueness of the test that they are hyping up is this metabolic, um, you know, the, the gene activity. And that's the part that I'm just, I'm still so freaking confused on. Um, and I'm not like, this is not my first rodeo. This is not my first stool test interpretation. Like I, I know what I'm looking at and I'm still deeply confused and deeply frustrated. And like I said, talking to the company, I got precisely zero helpful information from that. And I got the distinct impression that the guy was just bullshitting me and he had no idea what he was talking about. So um, until, uh, I don't know when I would when I would recommend this test, but um, I might use it a little bit here or there because I think it still has some strong points. Um, but overall, not what I was hoping for. Um, so it is what it is. Um, I will see you guys in the next series though. We will be going over my Somogen test. Somogen is another whole genome shotgun sequencing test. So same technology as this, it's a different company that does it. And uh, I will tell you why I think that that one actually is gonna be my test of choice when I'm doing whole genome sequencing as opposed to the BiomeFX. Again, unless they make some changes and update some things, um, I think that that's gonna be the winner, but I will tell you more about that in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.